Welcome to the Bayesian Conspiracy. I'm Ineash Brodsky. I'm Steven Super. I'm Jay Sticky. And Steven is on remote today. If you hear any difference in his audio quality, that is why, but it shouldn't be that much different. We are actually going to be getting a little bit ahead of schedule. Normally we record eh, three days or so before uh, an episode goes live. Uh, now we are getting a little bit of a backlog because I'm going to be out of the country for a number of weeks soon. So for cool reasons. Yeah, for cool reasons. I, well, I'm going to be at Burning Man for a week and a half, I guess. Jealous. I like how you said <laughs> you said that uh, out of the country for weeks. When in fact you'll be out of the country for like a few days. But Burning Man is essentially not in the country. So <laughs> yes, I do not count Burning Man as in the country. It's it's hard to get in contact with the outside world at all you know, when you're at Burning Man. That's a good point. And that's at the beginning of September, end of August to beginning of September. And then mid-September, I am going to England because I was invited to the Ink in the Abbey writing retreat. Uh, that's an effective altruist thing that's going down. That's really awesome. For the next couple months or so, our episodes will have been recorded at least a week in advance, maybe more. So if something amazing happens in the world and we don't talk about it, that is why. We should just do a backlog of like three, four months worth and then just not touch on any current news. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah, wait, way to crush it, man. Like a fucking boss. I'm stoked for you. I'm so excited about secondhand experiencing this through you. I, I will tell you guys all about it. <laughs> I'm sure it's going to be absolutely awesome. I, I will do all that once I know it is safe to do that. Because again, I'm still not sure if this has been publicly announced yet. They told us to keep it on the DL for now. Oh, I see. Okay. So only you guys know, plus, you know, a few select family who I know aren't going to blab things. Plus, if we're not editing this out, everybody is listening. Yay! Yay. Because okay. they're exclusive breaking news about any ashes. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the things that people pay for. Oh, yeah. So we are going to be talking about a thing that I will get to after. Haha, look at this. The what? listener feedback. Oh, you found it. This comes from the great Nick on the Discord. We were talking mm -hmm. about Friendship is Optimal recently. You know, he was asking, should I read it? Whatever. And then he looked up and he was like, wait a minute. Is it 11 chapters long? I thought it would be a million words. <laughs> because yeah. most web fictions are obscenely long. And yeah, no, this is, this is just 11 chapters. So, I mean, it's still the length of a short novel. Uh, like a but, <laughs> but compared to, you know, the typical web fiction, it is not long at all. So if, if that's what's been holding people back, go go nuts, go read. Yeah. Also, um, assuming that this is, still exists, and I'll try to find a link. There was also a reading of it, on, and it's split into parts on YouTube, but it's, other than that, like, perfectly serviceable. Oh, cool. Nice. Yeah, it's funny because we talk about it like there's a ton of content, because there is, but it's, it's uh, nicely condensed compressed yeah yeah it, it doesn't you know pad itself out with a ton of extra stuff not saying that all long things really do writing. I, I really you know you know me i really love big long things because phrasing i crunch through <laughs> okay <laughs> <laughs> thing is that i want to be like actually i don't like the long things there because like you know you know yeah no one likes to go to the gynecologist for no. a reason but uh that aside uh <laughs> I like having lots of words to read because I crunch through words really fast and then I'm sad because there's no more words to read. Mm. But um, I also do love when there's just a little short story uh, snippet, like clip that just the writer is so good that they imply so much more to the characters in the world that yeah that you can just sit there thinking about forever. Because obviously I think about this story all the time. I feel like I bring it up almost like every other, you know, podcast. Yeah. Utopia Law is a good example of a story that has... Yeah, that one too. Yeah, like it's super short, but there's a lot to talk and think about in there. So anyway, get to reading, people. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you don't want to and it's not your cup of tea. I just mentioned in general, people should read. You know, oh, yeah, totally. These, these are on the... As long you as should, you're reading, these... I've written a novel. Yeah. <laughs> I enjoy you your should... novel too. Oh, thank you. Buy that one. You don't have to read it. Just buy it. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I, I would... I mean, honestly, if it was down to read it and don't buy it or buy it and don't read it, I would prefer read it and don't buy it. Oh, that's awesome. I mean, I, I think that's just the, yeah, you the feeling of most artistic people. Well, like, you, you also kind of didn't really write it to make money. Like, you wrote it as sort of a labor of love. I mean, right? it's 100% like, available for free online right now yeah. at whatliesdreaming.com, so... <laughs> So yeah, there you you can read it for free if you would like. But I'm also not against getting money. 
And I'm only mentioning this because in our last episode, they said marketing was an important skill. So I guess I'm trying to do better at that. I also don't want to be turned into the person who's like every episode, hey, here's my thing, you know, constant <laughs> shilling. Well, yeah, that's probably an example of bad marketing, though. Yeah. Uh, I don't like that, that one kept resonating with me after we finished the episode because I don't know, while we were recording it and I saw that, I was like, oh, yeah, marketing, like this one's calling me out personally. I, I hate marketing, I'm bad mm -hmm. at it. I hate self promotion. And then. Yeah, for like the past week and a half or whatever it's been since then, like it just sort of keeps seeming to come up. And like, oh, that's an example of why people should be better at marketing. Or like, oh, that's an example of someone doing really good marketing. And it's just like, God damn it. Nice. <laughs> I mean, also lame, but. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so shall we go into our main subject? Yeah. Let's do it. Uh, this was suggested by Stephen, but apparently it was also suggested by me. So I would have suggested it too if I could have found it. Okay. <laughs> this came straight out of uh, SCP. We don't know where it came from. We can't trace its <laughs> origins. The website that it copied this from is gone. Yeah. Yeah, like track down the original poster. If they're doing something else now, I mean, it'd be cool to read more of their work, but also just so we know that we didn't summon this from like an Eldritch <laughs> world. We dreamed it into existence. Yeah, if anyone wants to do a skip uh, yeah. trace on this this post, you're welcome to. I'll put it in the description. Wherever it came from, Jace read it years ago. Uh, I think it was originally published 2018. I think Inyash sent it to me or to us in an email like a month ago. Hmm. I thought we could cover it in a couple minutes, but then there's actually a lot to discuss in here. So it's kind of fun. We should check it out. So that's that's the plan. Stephen, what is this post called? It's called Jugad Ethics. And uh, what Jug the heck is that? A jugad is a uh, is the Hindi term for a horse drawn car. Uh, no, post no, no, no. Well, that's an example of a jugad. That is an example of a jugad. It's uh, like a slang for sort of a jury rigged item, oh. where you could say like maybe jalopy. Would yes, be of course. Sort of a parallel. My bad. It's, there's a article I think like five six years ago about some prominent. Indian academic, I'm not sure, who says we have to leave behind the philosophy of Jugad. It, it is a thing we take pride in, and uh, it is a thing that gets things done because if we make do with what we have, and that is the essence of Jugad. But also, we really start got to start having things work correctly. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, was the gist of the article. So Jugad is great, but we should not rely on it exclusively because then we will never advance past a certain frontier. This reminds me again of the sort of changing strategies, like Derek Sivers' idea, you know, like the kind of say yes to everything. Then when you, once you've reached a certain point, then fuck yeah or no. But like in this case, it's a kind of used you God until like you've made it to the point where you can be selective, I guess. I mean, but that's hard because yeah. the reason you're using Jugad is you just don't have the resources. So we should quickly say Jugad is uh, making things work with what you have. And the example they give in this article, which Stephen mentioned, is a God. This looks like a car from the what seventies. There's yeah, like a, a the frame of a car and part of the body of a car cut in half, and yeah. it's been jury rigged into a horse carriage. There's a horse pulling it. Yeah, it's the basically <laughs> it's the back half of a car with a horse acting as the engine. I've seen other examples uh, that people would use as archetype, like Jugad. Uh, there's these like scooters that a lot of Indian people will sort of build out of scrap. <laughs> and hilariously just you know tie a bunch of like farm animals and their whole family and <laughs> suitcases and stuff too and you just see these things that are held together with duct tape mm. and bungee cords just driving along yeah. all the time <laughs> it's like one of those redneck there i fixed it yeah things it says in the article the closest english term is probably hack mm. yeah that's probably better than jalopy i don't even know if anyone uses that word anymore <laughs> i thought it meant a rundown car yeah i guess I don't okay. know. I was just realizing. I actually don't know what it means. This is the one time I heard it. Yeah. Well, we could get nerd sniped about that, or we could keep talking <laughs> about this other thing. Let's talk about this other thing. Sorry, Stephen, I interrupted you. Please continue. No, you're good. Um, they use this as a launching off point, the author does, for, again, it's called uh, Jugad Ethics. So the idea is, okay, we've got you know part of a thing that used to be really functional, and an old framework that we can shove it into to keep it running, i.e. like the car and the horse. I think the idea was something like the horse worked for a long time, but it's not as good as a car. So the car came along and replaced the horse, but the car needs a lot of maintenance, needs a lot of technology, needs a lot of specialized input to keep running. And when that breaks down, you kind of attach what's left of the car to the few horses you still have around and make do with that. But 
either one of these is worse than just the old horse and buggy technology since the buggies were specifically adapted to work with the horse as opposed to these cars which are sort of hacked together all right why don't, why don't you describe this poster that made the the author here think of this uh the whatever horse and car buggy before we do the poster i wanted to start with a slightly less inflammatory one so, yeah, which is why i pulled the fast into yeah sure so there's this other example um the ussr beginning to quietly tolerate the Tol- tolkachi a uh, class of middlemen and fixers who made the under the table deals within between various state enterprises on one hand this allowed the economy to function at all on the other it could function only as to god capitalism which is less efficient and humane than actual capitalism simply because it had to work in secrecy while pretending to be communism. <laughs> and I think, I hope at least we're all pretty familiar with this, that communism was, you know, like no, no capitalism. Everything is directed from on top uh, so that we can coordinate everything perfectly, except they couldn't coordinate everything yeah. perfectly. And to make it work, there was this thriving kind of like a black market, a gray market, a bunch of fixers acting basically like a, a market mechanism. Yeah. Like a yeah, we're, we're secretly the free market or yeah, cl- something close to that. Uh, yeah, I find it sad that you know communism. Uh, I think like most rationalists are also on board with like cool idea doesn't work mm-hmm. in practice, mm-hmm. and it's it's just sad though because mm-hmm. uh, of the implications it has about humans yeah. <laughs> and uh, the fact that like any you know functioning example of communism we find is actually doing this you know like China. <laughs> supposedly communist and yet not uh, even a little well no that's not true they are, oh, they're they like, are i don't know there's yeah. i have a or i had a chinese friend a while ago and i was just absolutely confused by chinese culture because this girl uh didn't like day to day didn't wear makeup like wore like you know clothes that it looked like maybe got from the thrift store or whatever and just like a really like seemingly cool down to earth person and I, I mean seemingly she was but then also she came to the U.S. to like work for the summer and then also just sort of travel. She spent her first three paychecks on a Swarovski necklace. Wow. That was a silver heart that had a single Swarovski gem in it. And it looked like nothing. Like, you know, from my untrained eye, I was like, it looks like something you could have got at the dollar store. But like, she's like, oh, no, if I go back to Beijing, everyone will know that this is Swarovski. And that's a big brand in the U.S. Huh. And there's this whole thing that she explained about how there's brands, like there's stuff they make in China only for the U.S. market. So if people walk around like carrying this and that handbag or wearing these shoes, people will be like, whoa, they went to the U.S. Mm. And it's really common apparently for like working young women in China to spend their first like three paychecks, like save that up and buy a single handbag because that's a sign that you've made it. Mm. And I just... I'm fascinated by like hearing about this the way I am with any like you know or, like alien culture. <laughs> like, yeah. wow, that's cool. I could never imagine what it would be like to be like. That. <laughs> My parents had a lot of stories in, uh, growing up in communist Poland about things like. Oh man, that sounds. I want to hear some of these. I mean, the one that most sticks out to me was that uh, my mom's neighbor down the hall was the uh, toilet paper monger i guess <laughs> like one day there's the, always one yeah well i mean one day there was a because normally everybody lines up long before the stores open and goes in and gets whatever they can because there's nothing ever on the shelf so you get whatever you can and this one lady went to the store uh, just as a toilet paper shipment came in and she was like fuck yeah filled up as you know her shopping cart all the way took everything she could possibly carry home with toilet paper and then like you know everyone in the apartment block knew that like if you need some toilet paper go you know she'll trade it for some sugar or some flour or something else she needs you know it it was very much a <laughs> it was the market one step removed right because you never knew when anything would come in there was a meme during covid times that i think steven put on the basic it's uh like our internal thing it was like old french aristocracy but it was a bunch of guys wearing like brocade suits but they had toilet paper wigs <laughs> and they were sitting on thrones of toilet paper and it was like something about and the men of the covid era like mm-hmm. would, would want the resources to <laughs> <laughs> I got to see if I could find that again and post it because that was when you said that the toilet paper monger. I just mm-hmm. immediately imagined you walk in the apartment. She's like sitting on a throne of yeah. toilet paper with like a big toilet paper wig. <laughs> Come yeah. forward on your knees, peasant. Yeah, generally, when when some person got something because it came in stock, quickly people would know who had what and you know where you could go to get these things that you needed. And obviously, these uh, the USSR. What was the Tal Talchki? 
uh, Tolkachi. Called Tolkachi. They're they're not. It's not the same thing because they they're you know working for state actors and large companies, but it, it's a similar thing. Yeah, I like the idea of a class of middlemen and fixers. Do we have something like that? Uh, retailers. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Some companies have those. Um, yeah, it seems like there's a good market for like whatever. Chinese goods that they only sell in the U.S. that apparently are status symbols, they could just keep some and sell locally for you know yeah. a mm. cut. But I'm sure that's against the law. So yeah, the example basically pointing to the fact that the old market forces that were uh, it was decided they were not good; they had to be replaced by something better, a society-wide coordination mechanism that could you know help eliminate poverty. But uh, it ended up having too many problems; it couldn't work practically the way it was, and so. Slowly, the old system of capitalism crept back in to fix these problems, to, to make them work again. But it didn't work as well because it couldn't work in the open. It had to work while chained to communism and pretending it's still communism. Yeah. And that makes it a jugad. You make do with what you got uh, because it's, it's a crappy, failing communist system that's being shored up with the capitalism that you can cram into it and lash to the front of it like a horse to a car. Yeah, you can jury rig a thing. <laughs> That's like bad to make it less bad and kind of functional <laughs> yeah. in in the place of the preferred thing. I wish that they had kind of gone more into the examples of, I don't know. <laughs> well, now we can get into the controversial examples. That's true. Um, <laughs> Steven, do you want to take this first one? Yeah, I'll give it a shot. <laughs> I mean, so this is, this is not a long post. Uh, I'm going to try and describe this poster. So it's, it's, it's a picture of two people drinking. They look happy. They, one's got their arm around the other. It's a guy and a girl. The top says, Jake was drunk, Josie was drunk, Jake and Josie hooked up, all caps bold, Josie could not consent, all caps red. The next day, Jake was charged with rape. A woman who's intoxicated cannot give legal consent for sex, so proceeding under these circumstances is a crime. It only takes a single day to ruin your life. Think about it. Be irresponsible. And I can't tell if it's because it's a kind of a blurry picture or they blurred out like the attribution on the bottom right on purpose. But I think it's just low res. But yeah, there's some logo and like the such and such, you know, sponsored by the whatever organization. Yeah. And anyway, so what, like a poster on the subway or something, something like that. Um, so I like the, the way that the author phrases it. One must marvel at this cultural artifact, which was no doubt the work of a highly educated team. Multiple pairs of eyeballs passed over it before it was printed. Yet, judging from the many angry reactions it earned, most critics assume, assumed that the error was one of oversight or bad faith. How could they not realize that Jake can't consent either? Um, They've never worked in graphics design. Hmm. I just, man, that, that description of just like, look at this wonderful cultural artifact is how I feel all the time looking at like <laughs> billboards and things on the sides of trucks and just like, how did this get greenlit? Oh, God. Oh, that font. My, my wife said that she passed a gas station that closed. I don't know when it closed, but... Uh, the posted gas price is two dollars and change. So there's a cultural artifact right there. All right, so so this was well, funny. like the other thing that I want to point out. Hang on about the poster is that the way that they framed the two people because it's just all like way too much text and weird bulging, and so it's it's just the two people against a white background, right? Uh, Jake and Josie. Mm -hmm. Josie is being shoved to the far corner, and she's looking away from the camera, and Jake is like looking like he's like pushing himself to the center and making direct eye contact and it's just one of those things that bugs me because the framing is such that like it's it's making you want to like without even reading it or by, by skimming it it's still doing the job of you know illustrating it she's the victim and he's the perpetrator here but they're both drinking <laughs> yeah it makes him look creepy and also he's got the glass covering his face so it looks like you know he's trying to hide his identity yeah like she's holding her glass below her chin and she's smiling but her eyes are like squinched closed and she's looking away and like he's just like looking you know making direct eye contact almost like sort of like raising an eyebrow like yeah <laughs> you know what's gonna happen now mm -hmm. notably they're both drinking the same drink or what apparently yeah. looks like the same margarita um yeah this this reminds me i went to when was i in community college it would have been 2009 or 10 um so right like right at the cusp before like not even modern wokeism because that's like four or five years old but modern social justice kicked off i guess so it was right, right before that was kicking off i think is that roughly fit with your guys also around estimated timeline feels like 2016 was when it started ramping up and then like 2018 kind of i think 2016 was when it exploded because of trump but i feel like it was already starting to Whoa. ramp up before that was trump a thing in 2016 that's the year he was elected 
I Isn't it weird how old we are? Weird sense of time. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> anyway. So 2010, anyway, I bring this up because I, I, you know, I think the word woke existed, but it wasn't popular. Um, I remembered I had a teacher, uh, we were talking about something like this subject. I can't remember how it came up. It came up organically. It was not like shoehorned dead. The teacher didn't have much of an agenda, but she was making the same point. And I wasn't, this will come up in the less wrong posts, but I wasn't yet trained in the confident art of uh, dissent. Uh, so I, I politely dissented meekly and then shut up. Um, but I, I raised the question, like, cause, cause she had said like, yeah, if they're both drunk, you know, if they both have been drinking, it's, it's rape, the woman can't consent. And I was like, well, but how can the guy consent if he's drunk? And she explained to me that if you're drunk enough, you can't get an erection. <laughs> so I, I I thought this was, you know, at the time I was, uh, I think I'd been drunk the exactly opposite, once. but equivalent of the, you can't get pregnant from rape because the body has a way of rejecting. Yeah. That. Yeah. See, like, if I had the stones back people. then, I would have brought that up and I, I didn't have the experience being drunk either, but I have been so drunk to where like, I can't safely take a shower and mm. I, I could still, I don't know if I could maintain an erection, but you know, it, it's not like it's impossible. <laughs> Um, I so been functional while blackout drunk. Yeah, that's scary. It terrifies me. Like this has only happened three times, at, but like it'll be like the next day, people were like, "Oh yeah, like you were making a bunch of jokes and laughing, and then suddenly you like turned and like just were trying to beat down the door of the parking garage we were in, and we had to like drag you away." Yeah. And I was like, "Oh, I don't remember any of that." Like, but we we got our car back. Like, yeah, we got our car back. Um, <laughs> you scared the shit out of the guy working there. Also, you drove us home, and I was just like, oh, we probably shouldn't have done that. And they're yeah. like, well, we couldn't tell. <laughs> okay. Just like, oh, hmm. okay, so cool. There's like a weird robot thing that just controls me while I'm blackout drunk. I yeah, I have a blackout cool. drunk story which I'm not going to share here, but it's just the <laughs> weirdest fucking thing when you're like, I don't remember any of that, and yet apparently. My body was doing things. I guess my brain was involved too and just decided not to retain any of that yeah, information. Yeah, I think it's just the, the part that records what you're doing mm -hmm. stops. So, like, I guess it's still you. Sorry for the talking over. There's a tiny bit of delay on internet. Um, oh, it's okay. No, you go gonna, ahead. I was just going to say that the closest I have to that is what uh, it's always in Philadelphia calls browning out, which is where you kind of fade in and out. Mm -hmm. And it was like one time, and I just remember like being in different locations at a club, but. That was uh, that time at Milk, right? That's right. Aww. Every few years, I try going to a club to make sure I still don't like it. Um, <laughs> but I feel like we could find a club you like, but that's and yeah, we'll talk about that another time. That's that's a tall order. Anyway, so this is a super inflammatory example. Obviously, uh, this is not like a, as far as I could tell, probably didn't hail from a rationalist blog. Um, but oh, um, I think an adjacent one actually. Oh, neat. Um, where it is now it just says this was retrieved from this page which has been censored um but anyway uh i, I liked the idea of the jugad ethic the author goes on to explain how this is a good example but it, it was just a fun framework that i hadn't thought of before so anyway take the wheel so what does he say about this what makes this jugad i don't know how to succinctly summarize it even doing a better job than i have but i could probably summarize it if you'd like yeah i, I would like that this particular poster, as shown in the U.S., uh, is Jugad social yeah. tech. Like, I feel like when we kind of hit the digital age, like we as a species just started, you know, like running faster than we can really process. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of this Jugad people slapping things together, you know. Um, so in the specifics of this particular thing, the horse in this example is uh, the patriarchy, the old system. <laughs> I mean, he, he, they literally say it in the, in the article. The horse is the patriarchy. It's the old system of uh, fathers safeguard the, or their daughter's purity or whatever until uh, they, she can find a good husband. And then she's handed off to the husband and uh, everything's and fine. exchange. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the new shiny car is uh, the sexual revolution and everybody can decide to do whatever they want and it's cool if you're happy then that's the only thing that really matters and the part where it falls apart and I, i'm sure anyone who's lived long enough has seen this is that it turns out that lots of casual sex generally just isn't great for women and this tends to be because men suck at sex. <laughs> uh, or, or, you <laughs> or, know, like you say that actually the patriarchy hasn't been thrown away at all. So there's, 
a lot of people kind of pretending that it's not there while still behaving in a lot of ways as though it were. Sure. But uh, in, in terms of just entirely the sexual aspect of things, having lots of casual sex tends to be good for many men. I'm not even sure if I would say most, but mm. for a lot of men, uh, it is a thing they pursue and they don't feel horrible about doing. Whereas for a lot of women, if they pursue the casual sex, they think it's going to be great, but then the sex kind of sucks because the guy doesn't give a fuck about them or their pleasure and they're ruining it for all the rest of us. My but, experience has been so different. Yeah. Uh, and other people I know. In my case, uh, when I, whenever I wanted to just have casual sex, the other partner never wanted to. Like it was... Huh. I I kind of went into a thing thinking, okay, this is going to be a one night stand. And then like, maybe we can be friends with benefits going forward or I'll never see you again, whatever. But it would just be like marriage proposal the next day or like, Oh my God. Or the person just hitting me up constantly. Like, Hey, when can we meet up again? Or like, wow, that was so magic. You know, like uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. my experience was the, uh, and you know, with a lot of my female friends that there was a lot of frustration around women not being able to have casual sex because men really, really wanted attachment. Huh. All I right. would like also because nobody was actually communicating anything. Damn neurotypicals. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there were these assumptions from both sides that then would have to be assuaged, like by you know weird passive aggressive things like ghosting or <laughs> mm -hmm. signaling that like maybe they had in it like more. I don't know. God, I hate even thinking about. <laughs> me trying to figure this out on the sidelines mm -hmm. the autistic person being why don't you talk to them mm -hmm. i think it's just yeah there's a communication breakdown and mm -hmm. there's because everybody's they have these assumptions of what things are going to be correct or not correct but a lot of that stuff goes on in like modern dating culture I, i've even heard and i i hate this i hate this so much mm -hmm. apparently it's still considered the norm for if you go like on a date with a man like a man or signed male or mm -hmm. got like a, a, any kind of like male female dynamic that the guy is supposed to pay yes and then like and i'm as you know someone that identified as a feminist and i feel like i still want to in a lot of ways except i hate the way the movement's gone yeah. uh i want to be like I, I think you should pay for your own stuff <laughs> or or like split it down the middle like you could figure out some way to split it maybe based on who's got more income like there's a better way that you could do this, I mean, <laughs> but but I've had like even women that you know consider themselves to be social justice or feminists or whatever hand wave it by like oh well the wage gap is still seventy thirty so <laughs> it evens out and I'm just like that feels like you just slapped that reasoning on you you got it let's say yeah <laughs> like well, yeah. because you're trying to preserve this thing that benefits you and you don't want to but you don't want to admit that. I, I mean, honestly, I don't even think it's because it benefits them. I think it's because that's what um, feels sexy. That if the, Does it? I hate so, it. I'm, I'm, no, I, I, I realize you do. I hate people buy stuff like that. My, my you know, feeling going in is like somebody's infantilizing me and then like also, you know, assuming that like, yeah, first of all, they're making assumptions, they're infantilizing me, and then also there's this feeling of now you owe me something. Right. Uh, but, I mean, I understand everything you're saying, but also just taken on massive surveys, I, gosh, it was a couple months ago that I was uh, listening to uh, a, a report on this, that uh, women, when they're surveyed, and actually men too, uh, both agree on this, that... I know. Yeah, that it, it the men should uh, offer to pay, and if the woman does uh, offer to pay, the man should say no. Uh, I, I'm going to take it on anyway. And there's, uh, I believe it was actually about ten percent of women who replied that if the man does that, they would be all turned off, and the other ninety percent said yes, that is the correct way to do things because <laughs> I don't, I don't want to do, do evo psych or whatever. But apparently, uh, the the men are supposed to be the ones using the resources and showing they have resources or whatever. And if they don't and they allow the women to pay, then it's just a turnoff. And it's not even like a mental thing or a, I want to preserve what benefits me kind of thing. It's, it's just a, conscious a lot of the time, right? Too. It's, it's a just a, this thing. is how my genitals react kind of thing. You know, uh, it's like all of a sudden this person that was sexy wants to pay is for your sexy. dinner. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> or, my pussy doesn't want to fuck you if you're not going to pay for dinner, even though I know that's sexist. Ah, but you can't help what you find sexy or what you don't find sexy. Right. You it's like the whole, about it. yeah, my kink is not your kink thing, but the vast majority of people's kink is to let the men pay. Hey, l listeners, any listeners who are neurotypical or have insight, like, why are they like that? I mean, <laughs> why, don't, why don't two people go on a date and use the first date to discuss things like, here's how I prefer, you know, yeah, whatever. Because that's not sexy to them? 
just to give an example, because I like talking about how awesome my relationship is compared to the baseline relationship. My wife and I have always done yeah, this. Yeah. If we go out anywhere, you know, the, 10 years ago, like on our first dates, we would just pay for our, we'd get separate tabs, right? When we were first getting to know each other. Now, typically I pay for it and she Venmo's me immediately because I get credit card rewards. Um, but <laughs> nice. like, you know, if I want to take her out on a nice dinner, I do that and I cover it and, and vice versa. She'll take me out once in a while and it's really cute. And the, as far as putting up on income, we like for our combined bills, like the house stuff, um, we do that on a ratio of how much we each earn. Like, I, I think it's, it's the way that any two sane people would do it. I have no idea why that's not the baseline, but anyway, so we're without ever <laughs> crushing it. So, well, in the same way that, uh, the neurotypicals tend to find that arrangement, the thing that works best for making them feel like having sex. Uh, in a similar way for a, most of them, men are just kind of suck at sex. So women don't feel very good with casual sex. They like still have the sex drive, but give it five, 10 years. And it's like, this is not fulfilling anymore. I just want to have like a few people that I know are good at sex and keep banging them uh, as opposed to this, this, constant churn um and it's not how it works for me at all too but also i'm just an outlier in all these categories and <laughs> should probably just shut up okay <laughs> believe what the majority of people say it's I, I don't know i've been seeing it more and more but then again also the people that i hang out with are slowly getting older at a rate of about one year per year and so <laughs> uh they're like i'm <laughs> I, I wouldn't be surprised if the new young people uh still are jumping into this and are very happy about it but I also wouldn't be surprised if, as they continue to get older, they also tend to find more and more that the women are not happy with the sex they're getting and they're not happy with the sex lives they got. And that brings us back to the cool new technology is, you know, fast and sexy and cool, but it doesn't actually really tend to work all that well uh, when it comes up against certain conditions. And so uh, they they hack in this old thing, the... The yeah. example given in the post is that uh, the ancient societies all knew that men and women have different payoff matrices for the sorts of casual sex where uh, one of the cells has momentary pleasure <laughs> and the other one has years of child rearing. And so... Not even bringing childbirth into the equation, which yeah, we yeah. talked about two episodes ago. We did, which is horrific in its own right. Uh, and so that in the night of heavy drinking and drunken hookup, the vast majority of the risk and cost falls on the woman and the woman's family, which is very important, especially in ancient uh, or in older civilizations, because you'd be living intergenerationally. You'd probably, you know, have a household with your grandmother and your aunts. Yeah, it's not like Mom one person got pregnant. It's like the older, family now has like another burden. All of their kids, yeah. So like, yeah. And so that was why uh, they did things like if a man went around sleeping with someone who wasn't he wasn't married to would get strung up, run out of town, beaten, something like that. And that actually usually like the women would be punished. The women would be like, too. That yes. was the idea of men. So they're wild oats when they're young and the women are the ones that are supposed to guard their own purity. It depends who the man slept with too. Like yep. someone of ill repute, it would be okay. But if they were going after like the mayor's daughter or something, that guy's going to get strung up. Uh, All but kinds of fun stupid politics were involved exactly and so that is why uh the post calls this poster that steven was talking about a case of jew god ethics because it is a recognition that the costs fall heavily on the woman and her family and most of the benefits accrue to the male and so they're trying to make men terrified of sleeping with the women they are not married to the benefits and the drawbacks because again they say he will be charged with rape right and they like Exactly, and, and a rape charge will ruin your life. Yes, that's 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 why the poster somehow magically forgets that they're both drunk. So logically, neither of them should be able to consent, and either both or neither of them should be charged and with rape. We have, as a society, still haven't figured out what to do with that scenario. No, well, th that's what they're saying. That the the Jugad ethic is it says she cannot consent. It doesn't say anything about him. It's hooking up the old horse to the c new car. Yeah. The new car is consent. And how do you how do you men rape make, women not the other way around? Yeah, how do you make it so that he gets negative consequences for doing this? And you say that she could not consent, and it's logically stupid. It's like looking at a horse pulling a car, but that is how you get back to um, disincentivizing this sort of thing. Uh, one one more sort of jump back mm -hmm. that I just thought of, um, like I mean, related to kind of how we were talking about how how different people experience this mis mishmash and like 
miscommunication with how you are supposed to conduct yourself with sex and relationships and stuff. I've heard so many complaints from women, especially when it's like an older woman having sex with a younger guy or just even like younger women having sex with younger guys that they're like, they, it's so hard to like do anything sexy with them because they keep being like, do you consent to kiss? Yeah, do you consent yeah. to me holding your hand? And they're like, wait, let me pull out my big file of documents that I'm going <laughs> to need you to sign before that, that shows that you, and it's like, this is the consequence of, I mean, like, you know, someone coming from a good place decided we need to make consent a really big deal and push like the education that consent is necessary. And then there's all these freak out things of like saying no after saying yes is still saying no. And like, I don't know, just like every, every edge case, but like, you know, even to the point where it's still sort of implied that even if a man and a woman are equally drunk and then they have sex, it's more the man's fault than the woman's for some reason. Do you, you, I love that you mentioned your friend who was like, it's like they want to pull up a big consent contract. There's some, some of them have. Like, I've, I've heard these like horror stories from people that were just like, I can't do it with this guy anymore. He's like, it suddenly turns into like, it's so anxious. Like, can we just have sex? Like, you know, I'm on the pill. Like, I got my test. Yet. Like, it's good. You know, like, I'm good with this. And they're like, well, it, it feels like he doesn't trust me to be able to say I am comfortable with us just like doing stuff. And I like, I will say stop if I don't like it, but we don't have to like go into this deep, deep love. But it's like guys in this, come in just terrified yeah. of being like accused of rape because they didn't get all the right consent signatures in the right forms. That, <laughs> that is literally the point. It, it says in the post that in fact, humans have been drawing up contracts before sex for millennia. It was called marriage. <laughs> <laughs> Slowly and probably unconsciously, we took the existing material of gen gender egalitarianism and cobbled together a Jugad patriarchy that pretends not to be one and it's less efficient and less humane, etc. Um, what do we think about all this? Because honestly, I, I'm still really liking the sex revolution, <laughs> but I think a hugely important part of this is if men aren't fulfilling their end and leaving the women feeling shitty and, you know, both emotionally and sexually unfulfilled after sex, then I, I guess they do education, need, but like it's, it's that, that also be, has they, not been my experience. And again, maybe it's uh maybe I'm a weird outlier that hangs out in a bubble of cool people. So, well, I mean, and also like, what, what can you do? Yell at men, be better at sex. I like, mean, it seems the only thing you could do. <laughs> <laughs> or rather, uh, it doesn't work anymore that yelling do better works for anyone. Like all you can do is in make these incentives where people are terrified to, have sex if they don't have a contract to someone, such as a marriage. Yeah, or like, you know, have somebody who's just walking on eggshells all the time, worried that they're not doing it right, and yeah. not trusting the other person. Like, the, the important part is not trusting the other person to be able to say, like, you can stop. Yeah. You know, like, Yeah, it's just, it's worse you. in every way, and right? And if, like, if some, you know, conflict comes up, we'll talk about it then, but, like, yeah, couple of things well, <laughs> there's an episode of it's always sunny in I philadelphia just hear Steven thinking in the background mm -hmm. there's an episode of it's always sunny where dennis tries to get some girl to sign like a contract before they hook up <laughs> and it's exactly as off-putting as you would imagine um you know I, I think it's not and to be clear you know i know you weren't making this point but it may have come off that way that like the dis the dissatisfaction that is being addressed here isn't like you know sexual dissatisfaction it's uh you know sexual abuse right um so i mean i think it's both because people who are sexually satisfied won't feel like they've been abused although uh, you're right we want to avoid abuse more than the other one you can I think, experience pleasure while being raped okay but that's different than yeah, sexual satisfaction true. you know leaning back and like you know in cartoonishly enjoying a nice cigarette and be like that was awesome you don't do that after being raped right um but you know you, you might you might have uh uh, it traumatizes you a lot more if you do orgasm while being raped or like have any kind of, and like most people do actually, because, you know, our it's stimulation, sexual yeah. stimulus, it, it like isn't directly tied up to our rationality. The brain can be like, no, 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 do not want. And the body mm -hmm. could still be enjoying it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then that's another thing to feel like disgusting and guilty about afterwards. And if, and if society as a whole could talk about it more, we'd realize that like, that's a failure mode of like a lot of our cognition. Um, but <laughs> Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, like, there's the whole, uh, you know, when someone's trying to accuse someone else of rape, they go, like, well, were you wearing sexy clothes? What were you doing going out to a bar? Why were you talking to people of the opposite sex if you didn't want to be raped? Oh, it's just sort of like... 
Like the thing is, okay, I was I was talking a little earlier with a few people about the new decentralized web that is being created or trying to be created. And I was saying, you know, we had the decentralized web when it first came out. It was amazing and I loved it. But people went through a lot of work to centralize everything because it started out decentralized. There was no centralization. And uh, they were rewarded very handsomely for centralizing things because apparently people really wanted their web benefits. centralized. Yeah. yeah. And that's the thing. Like, I really like the sexual revolution because I don't think anyone should be ashamed for having sex. I cannot be monogamous and happy at the same time. It's It's not me you know and i want to be with other people like me who feel the same way and want those same things out of life but uh if the majority keeps going back to you know well we tried the sexual revolution thing and it turns out awful for the majority of women so we're but sneakily we putting it. patriarchy back in under the guise of you know consent or whatever then what, what do we do if people keep trying to pull things back into this other system that seems to work better for most people. We argue about, I don't know, uh, both, let's say with communism, uh, there was this book a while ago, Scott Alexander was recommending. Okay. Red Plenty? Yeah, Red Plenty. Okay. Which was um, a theory of how communism could have actually worked if we had just tried it. The thing of the, the sexual revolution didn't work is bullshit because we didn't actually have a sexual revolution the same way we haven't ever actually had communism. Th those are all jagad too. I Maybe. disagree on both points. Okay, well let me uh, finish with the sexual revolution part okay. because everybody was still bringing in preconceived notions of patriarchy and also failing to consider things that would have been really important. Uh, like for example, childbirth is terrible and STDs are a thing. <laughs> They were involving drugs, and it wasn't done in a very rational way. There wasn't, like, lots of education about good, like, healthy sex practice going on. It was just sort of, let's throw out all the rules and do whatever we want. Well, the the original patriarchy was specifically because childbirth is terrible and STDs are a thing. Yeah. And the sexual revolution was only made possible by technology that made both of those not really things you had to worry about anymore. Ah, uh, that say that but those were things that a lot of people ended up having to worry about well those people were dumb they were dumb <laughs> but, but most people are dumb and that's why we like i mean if you're if your revolution can't account for the fact that most people are dumb then yeah it was a bad good. revolution that's what i'm saying like it, it had a good idea it, mm. it, it was not well thought out the way it was rolled out i mean it wasn't thought out at all it was yeah, yeah. you don't think out your revolutions you just have them well some of them are planned but uh we call those uh, CIA actions. Mm. <laughs> We're getting so I think off, that there, there the are a few other examples of this kind of thing. Like you know, I I try to think of um, you know, and the post brings up a few more, but I think they get kind of more and more both more specific and less useful. Like I liked the example of um, you know stealth capitalism, but that uh, <laughs> I think that might be the the second best one in here compared to the main one, but. Like, I'm trying to think of, like, I think all of us saw this where, like, you know, we're in the, whatever, the friendly left circle, and then they kind of start eating their own tail and attacking each other and fighting enemies that, you know, real or imagined, kind of like, you know, like a Red Scare communist sort of thing. And oh, it yeah. can be for, like, it's often for slights, like, saying the wrong word or Everything's something. Everything's tribalism all the way down, and it's infuriating. Right. But I think it didn't. It didn't used to feel that way. It used to just be like progress. And I'm tr I'm trying to think of like a way to to oh man, articulate. I think it's because we had common enemies. <laughs> you think that's it? That it was Steven, just like yes. You you pasted something in blue here in the documents. Uh, did you want to hit that? Uh, I brought this up because this this you sent this over. Uh, this was in the email that you sent me. This link in. I, I can I could read it. I don't agree with it. I just you wrote this in the email that you sent us. Oh, okay. Okay. I, I remember the background now. I wrote a couple uh, posts on my blog pondering why the TradFam movement was gaining a fair amount of traction among uh, young-ish people today. TradFam? Like, uh, like TERFs? No, TradFam like traditional family. Oh, TradFam with an A. I yeah. am sort of... I, hmm. Like married, I monogamous, man, woman, man works, woman stays in the house and raises uh, kids. Hmm. That you know. I would be in favor of that if it didn't specify which one was the man or the woman. I mean, you could probably do that, 
Uh, I mean, it like, tends to revert to the man working and the woman raising children due to the biological. That would never work for me. I understand I've known that for a long time. Like, yes. I, I want to have kids, but I need to not be the primary caretaker. Right. I'm not nurturing. <laughs> right. I mean, you could do it the other way too. It's just that's the way it's typically done in the trad fam scene, I guess. Yeah. And uh, the some people I was discussing it with. Uh, the fuck, I can just call him out because he doesn't mind. Wes uh, <laughs> thinks that Wes he, likes arguments. If if you guys want to, you know, yeah, discuss stuff with Wes, do it. I like arguing too, which is why I think we make such a great couple. <laughs> someday we'll move in together and start our own trad fam. Oh man, <laughs> Wait, me. But uh, like the kitchen table polyamory. Uh, I also posted that you know, trying to suss out why is this happening, and thinking you know, a lot of people are going back to these religions because they enforce the sort of marriage contract that people want which you cannot get in secular government anymore uh it doesn't have nearly as many consequences for breaking the marriage as the people who are joining this movement want there to be they they want a much stronger enforcement mechanism for what they are going to be going forward and doing with the rest of their lives and uh i think what's at one point said uh the reason behind this this trad fam movement is women are gaining more power in society and women don't actually like casual sex nearly as much as men do disagree now that women's influence is higher we're trying to transition to sexual norms that cater to women's desires uh and i, I basically do agree i mean obviously not all women hashtag yeah. but uh they, <laughs> but in general that happens and the majority often gets their way and like I, my response was that if we get a reversion to fundamentalism because dudes are emotionally shitty partners and make casual sex okay. not fun. That's going to piss me the fuck off. That was the thing that I, you actually said. it. Um, I, I was assigned female and might not trust me because I'm trans, but like also I have a lot of friends who are cis women that perfectly enjoy casual sex. And Why would we not trust you because you're trans? Why would you caveat that? Oh, I mean, like, <laughs> no, the thing is, I, I never trust a trans. I always like assumed that every like I, I would typical mind a lot, hmm. um, and I had in particular I was at this job where my boss kept insisting that I was a weird outlier and I like shouldn't call on my own responses hmm. from things. Okay, uh, so we, we won't trust you because you're right. weird, and that's why we love you. But it's not it has nothing to do with your <laughs> trans. <laughs> well, I mean, with gender, you know, preferences. My gender preferences skew a lot more male than female. I mean, maybe it's just trans. <laughs> maybe it's just because I'm aging, but. A ton of people I know, because of who I am and the kind of c communities that I hang out with, a lot of the people I know are people who did uh, enjoy casual sex or pursued casual sex. But over the years, all of them stopped, just stopped having it. They were like, you know what? It's just, well, it's not fun, actually. I, I was going to do the like, thing that well, you well, actually said. Maybe almost ac accidentally, you said if men aren't going to be good emotional partners. I think it's not that women don't like sex and men like it. It's that men don't like have the that they're not bringing the emotional aspect to it <laughs> right which is very important for sex with yeah. women and i don't know i would imagine sex with men but well, like maybe the, i'm wrong about that i think well okay i mostly know gay men that have expressed like you know expressed the same thing okay. but uh yeah there's like it's mm -hmm. like people can't figure out what to do with casual sex because it's been off the table and taboo for so long that like I imagine like, that most men who have a lot of casual sex are kind of more compelled to it by their sex drive than they actually enjoy it. And if they were to allow themselves to have more emotional, intimate connections as well as the sex, they would like that a lot more. Like, it, is there anything more cliche than the self-hating womanizer who just keeps sticking his dick in things and drinking well, because he can't face his own life. You hear from a lot of sex workers that a lot of male clients they have aren't just looking for sex. Some of them don't even have sex. They come there to like have their, you know, put put their head in her lap and have her like pet his hair and just do like basic intimacy things, just talk about his life. Yeah. Like that's what's empty in their lives. It's like a weird, you know, like people always sort of stereotype the like you know, this one just wants sex and this one just wants feelings. And I think that it's actually like individuals are individuals, so they're going to vary a lot. But I don't know if you could even really cut it down the line of male, female. I mean, honestly, I remember being a teenager and just the the hijack of your brain and your body that such a high dose of testosterone has is fucking ridiculous. I, I can absolutely understand i've had both puberties so. <laughs> just the the desire to hump a lot and keep doing it i think 
I think a lot of the problem is just being a man in the ages of teens to mid twenties is horrible. You're being driven by something that you can barely control. And, you know, that sucks. And it also sucks for people who sleep with you because they get caught by all that. Mm. What I'm saying is we need uh, fembots and give them to mm. all, mm. <laughs> all people at the age of 15 and then take it away at the age of 25 again when you can... You've you've expelled enough testosterone that you can start thinking so and feeling all well. People though, because like again, I I've experienced just vast differences, even in like cis guys I know. There's a and again, maybe it's bubble effects or who I'm attracted to or whatever. But most of the cis guys I've dated were actually way more into the like cuddly, intimacy, vulnerability. Let's like let's do dates and stuff than I am. Mm, that's because you. That's because you dated men, not boys. Maybe that's the that's the difference. <laughs> I right? dated boys too. I mean, <laughs> but I was always the one with the higher sex drive and the, the the pushier one. The like, also you know, like let's let's do things. You know, let's make goals and sit down and like you know. The, no, I like that you have a uniquely informed perspective. Like you said, having gone through both puberties, I think that what you know what it amounts to is that we're we're like in the context of this post, like the the ethic that. Like the framework that we were kind of all raised on in the 2010s uh, clearly isn't adequate, right? We even the three of us can't quite find the uh, the moral center here, right? Because we keep trying to generalize too much, to and be, that, that that's what the framework there was has no done. Sex ed that I got. They didn't teach us this in sex ed. They, you know, the world taught us this growing up, right? I mean, it sucks, but you learn a lot of stuff about sex and relationships through unrealistic movies and advertising right. and I think the sort of equivalent of the way people present themselves on Facebook or Instagram or whatever, where like, they're only going to tell you the coolest, best or like worst, grossest stories and everything's an exaggeration and you don't ever get to really see like, what's it really like? Do you guys get the feeling that there was this push, this not really a push, but this sort of sense in the, in the culture that, uh, a woman can do anything a man can do and should like should have the same wants as a man because like those are the more valid wants mm. and so women should act more like men have careers more like men be assertive like men and fuck like men and they tried that a lot and it just didn't seem to work very well <laughs> the funny thing is it worked great for lesbians <laughs> but uh <laughs> lesbians who famously have the least amount of sex well in in terms of at least let, let me um, <sighs> let me walk that back. At least in terms of number of encounters, but I've also heard um, lesbians tend to have sex for very very long periods of time and enjoy it a lot. Mm -hmm. So are as sexually fulfilled despite having less numbers of encounters than uh, than straight women. Yeah. Which again, maybe maybe just dudes should get better at having sex. There are YouTube videos out there. They 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 will tell you. Or I don't know. Again, like I go more from the. But talk about it a lot and like figure like compromise and figure stuff out because it's like no two people are going to be perfectly matched yeah. regardless but you think there was this drive to like you know be like a man oh, there act definitely like, a man, was. Fuck like mean, a man in the 80s or 70s they had those ridiculous power suits that they would have women wear where it was like but it's it's also that same jew god where it was like okay, well, we're going to make, you know, the women's suits more masculine by giving them giant shoulder pads and yeah. the makeup's going to get more masculine or whatever. But like, they're still all wearing three inch heels and <laughs> having to, I mean, like, it's the, yeah, women should be able to do everything men can do, but also they should still be all, doing all the things that women are supposed to do, right. which led to a lot of like women earning a higher salary than their partner, but also doing all of the chores and the childcare and being really like maybe that's why people are you know dissatisfied in relationships and not the fact that men are bad at sex or whatever or there's there's just a lot of stuff yeah there's a lot of stuff to talk about with uh gender politics but like well i wanted to get into another part of this post uh their discussion of uh jugat ethics because this was extremely interesting the fourth one on this list that i have here the notion of privilege which uh is the the new sexy car uh, <laughs> to the, some people yes it's the notion that unearned and self-perpetuating advantages accrue to members of various groups as a result of historical systemic oppression uh and the the post claims that this is the new sexy car it's a way of cramming the square peg 
uh, of natural human inequality into the round hole of a former, formerly classless social system. That, that everyone says, sentence. yeah, everyone says our social system is classless. We don't have this as a thing anymore, really. But uh, it's like everyone said, you know, the sexual revolution is now we don't have gender like norms yeah, or yeah. biology anymore. Yeah. Like what, that was what I was trying to say where it never really happened. This mm -hmm. is the same thing. Like, you know, hmm. oh, well, you know, we're a democracy, so we don't have aristocracy and lower classes. And it's, it's like, no, we, we do. Yeah. We still do. The post says that the ancient, uh, uh, ancient idea of this, the horse uh, thing was noble oblige. The notion that to whom much was given, much was required. Uh, and then later in the 20th century, we came to reject the notion that anyone could be given much of anything except by theft. <laughs> that uh, would they, Some of us thought that anyway. Yeah. Uh, there was a denial of the distinction between unearned advantages and ill-gotten advantages. But the intuition that the natural aristocracy owes something to the rest of us will not bulge. So budge. the moral... Sorry, budge. <laughs> <laughs> it won't bulge either, but yeah, it will not budge. So the moral calculus must be made to come out that way that the people who have advantages must give something to the people who don't have advantages. Uh, and therefore, uh, the claim is that the natural aristocracy actually got their advantages by stealing them. And therefore, we, the peasants, are entitled to steal it back. It's <laughs> jugad noble oblige. And I have seen this, like, I was on Tumblr before, even up to, like, past longer than I should have been on there, you know, before it was destroyed. I still hang around in, like, the same groups of people who will just unironically write things occasionally like eat the rich mm -hmm. or like they, they they will explicitly like you know say things that there was some magical time in history where everybody was given equal everything and mm -hmm. the rich got theirs by stealing the parts that should have belonged to everybody yes and that's bad so they need to be punished and also dehumanized <laughs> so yeah uh I've, I've seen that a lot too so i guess this implicitly makes two claims, which I think it would be interesting to talk about. That first of all, some people just have unearned advantages that are natural due to something other than systems of oppression. Mm -hmm. and no, that, as a result of systems of oppression. No, the well, the uh, like, sorry, the uh, original horse thing was that okay. some people just have natural advantages for some reasons. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, you and, like the... and the, the new Jugad is like, oh, they have advantages, but it's because of oppression. But okay. uh, we're going to ignore that for now and just concentrate on... I mean, I, I think it should be kind of uncontroversial. Do some people have advantages which they haven't earned, but which aren't due to oppression? They may be due to other things? Yeah, I mean, like, nobody asks to be born to whatever family mm -hmm. and that's just my my dad i remember when i was a kid told me at one point you're really really lucky to be born american and you should be really thankful for that because there's so many other places in the world you could have been born and everything would have been worse because america is the best country mm -hmm. <laughs> which i am incredibly privileged just by nature of being born in a, a white person in the u.s as opposed to being like you know, but people could claim that that's due to oppression that the U.S. oppresses other countries and that white people oppress other races. Hmm. So is so, there any... I don't see how there's a difference, though. Like, I, I think there's a big because difference. Because I still, as a baby coming into the world, had nothing to do with whether or not my ancestors did shit. No, I think that it's great because this is the this is where this divides into. The, the statement here is cramming a square peg of natural human inequality into the round hole of formerly classless social system but i think natural human inequality is doing some sleight of hand there and that's that's what we're getting tripped up on right so like i don't have the genetic makeup to be an olympic athlete i don't think that i could have taken home a gold if i'd been training since childhood like i'm within 10 percent of my dad's height and weight and my brother is too i think that's just like how we were going to be designed right so like th there's nothing much more natural than genes you know one one could argue that you know diet can be a factor there's certain things you can't overcome right um but that might be natural human inequality right like i'm not six yeah. five and i can't dunk a basketball and i can't swim as fast as uh what is that guy michael phelps where people might draw contention is like say class right uh well if you're wealthy you can have a few explanations for that. Like you might just be naturally good at business. You might, you know, have had an 
interest in it and read all the right books. Is that naturally good? Uh, I mean, I think in in the sense that like other things could be, and yeah, I'm 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 kind of spitballing here, but like, I, I don't think it has to be genetic. I mean, I think obviously some of it is genetic. Like some people are born healthier than others, and that has huge impacts on life. Some people are born. Uh, just with greater ability at intellect or greater ability at physical work than others. And those all have big intellects, uh, big effects too. But uh, genetics isn't all of it. The culture that you're born into, I think, has a yeah. huge difference. It's a ton of things. Whether your society is functional or dysfunctional has a huge difference. And I think all of those things are things that were unearned, but also those things aren't due to oppressing someone else. You can just be born into a culture that values things that are important for modern econ systems without oppressing a different culture, you know? Yeah, I actually always thought it was pretty wild that, or I don't know, like, this is going to paint me in a bad light, but I mean, the whole idea of, I I thought that like sort of one of our ideals as a country, the United States, was that we don't punish people for like the sins of their fathers or whatever, but there, there is such a thing as, and you might not call it this, but like reverse racism. I have met well, a lot of people of like Hispanic descent or, you know, African descent who just fucking hate white people. I and I it's... kind of can't blame them, yeah. <laughs> especially think... considering, you know, I know some of their backstories and I'm just like, yeah, no, if I were you, I would also hate white people. But at the same time, it's the, you know, um, you keep hearing kind of. I really hate the term reverse racism. It's just yeah. racism. Uh... Don't, don't add the reverse in there. I mean, the, the reverse is doing nothing there. So sure. But like, I do think Except for making it clear which way the racist arrow is pointing. Yeah. I mean, there's yeah, people that claim that you, you can't be racist if you're not a historically oppressed class. But like, uh, Those people are racists. <laughs> uh, yeah, but I don't know. This, anyway, this like, the idea of sort of the, that white people should carry around a ton of guilt for what their ancestors did and slash or like have to pay reparations. I guess it ties into kind of like affirmative action. and. So uh, to, to pull it back here, the Jugad part of this is that since there isn't supposedly human inequality aside from that made by systemic oppression, this must mean that anyone who has an advantage has it through systemic oppression is, I guess, the ridiculous idea, the Jugad part, because what's really trying to be done here is that uh, people who do have advantages are forced to give something to people who don't have those advantages or at least should be, feel really guilty about it which like they I don't do. think they should feel really well, guilty no, i mean like they, but i know a lot of people who do or i'm one of them i mean like but the idea used people to be that called... were born privileged in any particular way walking around feeling tons of survivors guilt about it and like yeah. i'm a bad person because i'm not doing more to address it yeah but the idea used to be called noble oblige it was just if you have advantages you give back something to people with those that don't have those advantages yeah. that's just the way it is that's it wasn't just tied being a on good this person. original sin idea i don't think it, it, maybe it was but like yeah i mean it, it doesn't i would feel more motivated by the concept hey you like you, you were you know born in a relatively wealthy country and because you're white you have certain like privileges and stuff so it would be cool if like you used some of that to give back and i'd be like yeah but not like you know someone coming out and being like you should be ashamed of yourself we deserve reparations for the right. way you people have it like you know like it's I'm, just clearly i'm totally on board <laughs> with the idea of noble oblige to be honest yeah. i i like it feels almost like a thing to take pride in that, yes, I do have these advantages, and yes, I am helping people if you are one of the you know noble class, uh, and that is a good thing to do, and that, that makes me a good person, that I'm helping others. I am fulfilling this obligation that I have, whereas the idea that like I am an oppressor, I belong to the oppressing class, and I need to be taken down and have things taken from me because of that would immediately make me think, no, fuck you, uh, you don't get shit. And I think is very counterproductive because it just makes things worse for everyone. And sure, some of the resources from the nobles are still being siphoned off to the underclass or whatever, but the nobles feel shit about it. The underclass feels shit about it. And it's probably less, maybe it's less There's resources than what have been otherwise. There's antagonism all around there. Yeah. Like, it's just a recipe for bad things. The second thing that I was, that I wanted to ask before we went into that, uh, before we got off to topic is the second uh unstated implication is that people who have advantages should give something to the disadvantaged uh is that true i think should in the sense of it is good to not it is a requirement and you are failing if you do not you're not a good person if you have tons of success and you don't do anything to help those who 
were less successful, like whether it's through luck or good or hard work or whatever, right? Well, like, the name I, I think that's the just... noblesse oblige part literally is obligation of the nobles, right? Yeah, and I don't like the obligation. I think aspect. obligations are important. I think things like duty and obligation are actually pretty darn important for any society and any human to live a They're fulfilling life. They're important, but um, I mean, uh, maybe like we need to def- better define our taboo words there, because like obligation to me means like you can't you can't get out of it you are obliged like this is a thing you must do and you'll be fined or whatever if you don't do it yeah you will be called a bad noble and maybe the peasants will badmouth you maybe they won't do the things they're supposed to do maybe they'll even foment a revolution that like there are punishments if you don't meet your obligations i mean what if you're having a really bad month (laughs) <laughs> as a, like nobles can have really bad months too i don't know like you're probably a bunch of not your family gonna get... members are sick and you need like i mean if you're normally pretty good and you have a bad month you're probably not gonna get overthrown for that one would hope yeah but i mean that's why i'm hesitant about the whole this is a law and you know absolutely this happens and because it just i realize you're hesitant but i think that's the whole point of him saying that or i I don't know if the writers are him actually, since this was recovered. Uh, oh. The this brought us back to the uh, the you got ethics thing, where you think yes, an obligation is a bad thing. I don't want people to think of an obligation, so you get rid of the obligation part. But then instead, you're stuck with, well, you got your advantages because you're an oppressor, and that is how we're going to take your resources now, rather than due to an obligation. So the jugad part, the horse hooked up to half of a car, is worse than the original thing was i just think there could be like something some happy medium between those two where it's like we're not gonna come with like flaming pitchforks to your door if you don't give tithes to the poor at, like because you were going through stuff i, uh, I don't think that's how this how it happened whatever, but like but I, there should be like but an acknowledgement that there is an obligation i think is better than an acknowledgement I that like, you okay. are an oppressive we don't race we have a system in capitalism and it's actually like a good jury rig of i guess status seeking where there is no obligation that like billionaires have to do charitable stuff Mm -hmm. but because of capitalism we've made it so there are like cool tax write-offs for doing so and other benefits and then also it makes you look like a good person because like so if you want to status seek the thing you should be doing and, and like positively motivated towards doing is doing charitable stuff and basically everybody benefits. I, I, I like these kinds of systems. If, if uh, there's a way that you, I don't know if you can like set that up though, ground up and not have like. I mean, I, I agree with you. I think that's literally what he's saying that billionaires should do that. They should feel this obligation, but we got rid of all that. And so now instead there's a bunch of people saying, eat the rich, unless the billionaires do things like, you know, prostrate themselves before the masses and. Mm. I don't know. Like, like, it's better to have just a formal obligation and, and acknowledgement it, of that obligation than to have eat the rich and we end up destroying all of capitalism yeah, on accident. You just, I don't know, but you're saying like it's better to have like. Because, I mean, like the real problem God of. Thing or something than like, then have something. Yeah, like it sounds like you're trying to say it's better to have the pre Jew God thing in its full form than the like shitty Jew God version. But I thought the definition was Jew God is still better than the previous thing. It's just not as good as the ideal thing that they don't have yet. No, I think the Jew God is worse than both because um, a, a car, a horse with a buggy is better than a horse hooked up to half a car. Yeah, but the thing is, you either have a horse hooked up to a half a car or just a horse. You don't have the option of the buggy. Right, and that is kind of the problem that it's pointing at. That it's is like problem, saying maybe we should like... bring back the buggy. The The real problem is that uh, people become incentivized to hide their success, and then people stop. Some people stop chasing success. Others just hide their success. Regardless, it's much worse than if humans could just be successful and also... Uh, realize that with success comes obligation. That sort of Spider-Man ethic. I think the weird Jew God ethic system that we have right now is still better than if we just all went back to 18th century like politics around. I mean, if you're talking about like I mean, I think sex and yeah. romance and relationships. I agree, and I think it's literally impossible to go back based and on the technology we have. My understanding of Jew God, I think, maybe is different than yours. Where I was saying Jew God is inferior to trying to make a car, but if in India, what you can do is get a shitty car and then until it wears down and then jury rig it into a horse and buggy, like, I think you're probably still better doing that in the interim between. 
trying to have the kind of civilization that can make the full car. Going back to horse and buggy would require like basically abandoning the car where there were probably like a few years of life that that car had. <laughs> that were really good years. And then you had a horse and a kind of buggy, which is still better than just a horse. I think that that's the, uh, th that's what this is pointing at that like, yeah, you can't go back to the way that things were, but this suboptimal equilibrium where it's like, we've got this hodgepodge of the past and the, the recent past slash present is that that's suboptimal. I think that's all that the Jagat is pointing at. I, I kind of wanted to pivot because you guys used this term twice, and it, I've been kind of thinking about this last week or two. Um, the the concept of eat the rich, and I I'm not, <laughs> not not so much specifically on that uh, taken literally, but I I was wondering because there doesn't seem to be a lot of distinction between like when people say things like eat the rich or you know whatever that that sentiment. It doesn't seem like it's that tightly distinguished between people who earned that money in their lifetime. And people who are, you know, the beneficiaries of generational wealth. Like, I people know. seem to hate Jeff Bezos more than they hate, like, the Kardashians. Uh, yeah. You know, maybe because Bezos is richer. Maybe it's just a, uh, you know, maybe it only scales with the net worth of the person. Um, but, like, you know, like the Trumps, you know, like, it's, you know, Donald Trump didn't earn his fortune in the way that, like, Damon John from Shark Tank did, right? But the thing is, like, at all. <laughs> right, exactly. Steve and I have met people and can't seem to talk them out of it either, which is very frustrating, who have this conception that, yeah, like, being rich is bad. Yeah. In fact, like, my parents had this prejudice to the point where um, I made friends with this Jewish kid, and I, as a kid, had no idea about class and whatever. We just both like science fiction and running around in the woods catching frogs, but, like, when my parents found out she lived in a really nice house and both her parents were dentists, it was just like, you can't hang out with that friend anymore because we're not the same social class. Mm. And there was just tons of jealousy there too. Where it was like, and like a fear, like we don't want you socializing with them and like picking up their ways or something. I don't even know. It was bizarre. Mm. But like, I, I, I can't wrap my head around it, but I have experienced over and over again people that just seem to think that, I don't know, like it, it, it feels like a, it's a mental block, maybe like a traumatic mental block where you can't actually humanize someone who's rich. Well, I, I think as the post pointed out, we, the, we denied the distinction between unearned advantages and ill-gotten ones. Yeah. So if someone has an advantage, obviously they lied, cheated and stealed to get it. And so yeah. they're a bad person, not just someone who, you know, managed to make something and get lucky or put in a lot of work or whatever. Anyone who's well off did it by stealing from others is where that mindset comes from and that's okay really toxic because oh yeah it's if awful. you look at all the different axes of what people call privilege like basically everybody needs to feel bad about themselves in some way and that does feel very similar to me too yeah well my trauma from catholicism which was everybody's bad and we're all sort of equally bad and we all need to sort of you know like it's it's one way to kind of i guess make people humble or jace i wanted to answer your question about uh, the jugat thing uh I think the problem is um, literally that the Jugad makes things worse by not acknowledging the thing that that is true that needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. That uh, instead of saying that, yes, people who have more advantages owe something to everyone else, uh, it says that people who have advantages are evil. Uh, and that's the way of solving that problem. It says instead of uh, men and women have different... Um, different risks and different payoffs from casual sex, it says that uh, women cannot consent. And that's how you make things equal. Like, if you could, in fact, acknowledge the actual problem, you could maybe solve it. But instead, you have this hack of saying, like, a woman can't consent if she's drunk, uh, because that solves the problem, but it doesn't actually address the root thing. I still think that the hacks are better than going back to, like, Leave it to Beaver era sexual politics the hacks aren't great and i mean like maybe that's why it's really easy because we're living in that time period right now and there's so many things that we're like oh this is bad this is wrong whatever but we haven't been able to i don't think anyone has been able to get to the thing like the perfect you know um sexual politics mm -hmm. 
relationship here's how to do relationships just right well i mean <laughs> like, we haven't reached that we don't know what that looks like yet but i, like I still I think said, that our bunch of slack together jerry rigs have are an improvement on just straight up going back to the past like i said i could not live in that world uh, at least not happily uh also stephen can attest to how much i despise nobility and want them all to be executed this reminds <laughs> but... me of like the thing where people are like oh you know uh, we have so many problems with our current political and economic systems let's just go back to monarchy and yeah no, I, have the, I have sort of the same reaction there where i'm like no wait yeah it's, <laughs> what we have right now isn't perfect but i don't want to go back <laughs> but having these hacks is just patently absurd and you can look at it and see on the as face of it that it's absurd. the hacks and I, maybe but that's, they do are you kidding me that's, yeah okay. that's the problem maybe that's the thing that we can agree people on. literally do they're like they the men can't have sex with women anymore because they're too fucking nervous unless they just turn out to turn into complete cads and don't care anymore and that's horrible for everyone yeah humans can't be successful anymore without hiding it because everyone keeps saying if you're successful you're an oppressor like the these are real problems that the jew gods have introduced and we'd be better off not having those problems addressing them directly you know yeah i would like if there was like a more uh legible a capacity for nuance there, there's like I, I took history and like you know politics and whatever in school but i i never remember anyone explaining this sort of dynamic you know where industrialization colonization whatever happens and then countries go through these changes and actually i'd be fascinated to take that class i'd really like to see what it was like uh you know importing all western technology and values to singapore back like when they were because they, they they really rapidly transformed from like rice patties Mm -hmm. <laughs> and farming and horse and buggy to like top world superpower before i i do this steven is there more you wanted to say because i realized you haven't been able to talk very much being all remote and such no no that's on me for being too lazy to make the drive um no i, I think that you guys helped clarify my confusion in fact this post did and that's kind of what i wanted to bring it around for it wasn't just like the eat the rich thing but it 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 helps articulate a lot of confusions of that vein like the reason that people can be equally mad at, uh, say, Donald Trump and Jeff Bezos, even though they earned their, even though they acquired their wealth in very different ways, is because they're both yes. wealthy and wealthy equals evil. Yeah. Right. Okay. It, it, so it it's it's a reduction because it's simplistic and it, and it fits with this. Uh, again, you you've got this this new ethic that says money is evil. And I was running with this example because it's a lot less uh, full of landmines than the examples in the post. Um, but you've got this ethic that money is evil. And if, and if there are examples that don't fit that, you know, like somebody earning their money through like a good idea that takes off. And maybe, you know, again, Bezos is, is an exception because he's got tons and tons of, of wealth. But, you know, like actually the, the company Otterbox, they make cell phone cases. Um, that, that guy started in his garage in Fort Collins where I grew up. Um, cool. like that, that's, that's a classic, you know, American dream started in the garage kind of, kind of gig, you know? Um, and, uh, I, I think he's doing pretty well for himself. Um, so it, it's, it's interesting. I think this fits into our discussion about the noblesse oblige. Apparently I was mispronouncing it the whole time because unlike every other French word with S's and this one, you actually pronounce the S. Fucking stupid. I hate French. Um, but <laughs> there was this Twitter thread said, uh, we can think of the ruling class as everybody who makes decisions that affect a lot of other people. Politicians, yes, but also corporate managers, media editors, government agency officials, etc. These people are all college ed educated versus only 38% of American adults and liberal. Educated liberals are the minority that rules the majority in the U.S. This isn't bad in itself. Pretty much in any community larger than a couple hundred people, there's a minority ruling class. But one idiosyncratic thing about the U.S. educated liberals is that they vehement, ve vehemently. vehemently reject the idea that in the U.S. a minority rules the majority, or at least deny that they are part of this ruling elite. It's the core tenet of the American civil religion, which they all adhere to. Educated liberals could probably do a pretty good job of ruling the U.S. and resisting crazy extremists within their own ranks if they just stopped trying to make solar-powered indigenous vegan drag queen story hour happen in Wyoming. Uh, uh -huh. I, I thought this was just like I would a go great... To that. <laughs> the what? <laughs> I said I would go to that. Yeah. <laughs> but that, that, that's an end goal, not a we need to get this off the ground first yes. goal. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I thought Perfect that was a goal. great example of how 
do god ethics can fuck things up because we do still have an you know a minority elite that rules and if they had a noblesse oblige kind of idea they would understand that they are different and uh they need to take into account the fact that other people are not like them and specifically the people they rule are not like them and so do not necessarily want all the same things they want and instead by thinking that like no everyone's like me i'm the majority because there is no elite minority in this country it really fucks up their ability to actually lead and pisses off all the uh plebs down in wyoming or wherever <laughs> Yeah, I, it's tough. I think a lot of people just don't like the, you know, so if they pretend, oh, there are, there are no elites, mm. some people want to hear that mm. because people don't want to be told like, oh, yeah, we actually do know better than you. You know, like we talked about that with, with Amaryllis, right? It's like, yeah, okay. Like, I, so I'm on, I'm on Amaryllis' side, mm. right? Because I, I'm ready for someone smarter than me to tell me what to do. <laughs> right. But a lot of people are resistant to that. And mm. there are circumstances where if someone smarter than me told me to do something that I thought was stupid... I'd be like, well, now hold up a minute. Can you explain yourself? Like, I don't have to explain myself to you. I'm smart. I'm like, well, hold on. Come on. Yeah. So I get where how this is has a very quick failure mode. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's just the, uh, crap, what's it called again? When you have to take a bunch of mental steps or explanatory steps. Inferential distance? Yes. Yeah. I mean, sometimes sometimes that is the case from, like, the smarter person does actually know a thing, but they're, like, it's like I would literally have to give you, like, I like undergrad chemistry course for you to understand this or something yeah but then i feel like if someone said that to you steven you'd be like oh okay not like or at least lessen your suspicion of them not just be like oh you're just you know my, my usual strategy for like responses like that is like just give me the explanation you would give to you know like a 15 year old mm -hmm. like if you're trying to explain this to them in 90 seconds mm -hmm. and if the, there are some things that are legit actually impossible to convey yeah. like that like i don't i don't think I still don't understand how GPT-3 works. Right. And maybe I haven't found an explain like I'm four. Everyone's done an explain like I'm five. I need I need even dumber. <laughs> um, but it, it's all, it might as well be some lack of trying. I think what I want is like just the explanation to stick with a no work on my part, and that's just not going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, so I think, but that's true for the majority of cases. You know, like you, you can zoom all the way out and give some, you know, analogy that falls apart at every seam, but very, basically works to convey the point, you know? Anyway. Where were we? You mentioned the one of the land that the post had some landmines in it, and I think by far the most controversial part of this post. Uh, I'm I'm just going to go ahead and read it, and then we can react to it. Consider the state of affairs in many parts of the world today, where governance, healthcare, and infrastructure development are overseen by nice white people. As recently as 50 years ago, these arrangements were formalized in a system we now call colonialism. Then we decided that colonialism was bad and decolonization was good. So we tried decolonization and were quickly reminded of why we had colonialism in the first place. Now we have the NGOocracy, a Jugad colonialism that attempts to provide the same administrative competence and moral instruction, but now using the old colonialism as a cover story. Nice white people must now administer African affairs in order to redress the historical inequalities wrought by nice white people administering <laughs> African affairs. I, I don't have much more to say about it. I mean, like, yeah, that that sucks. Yeah, I'll, I'll be honest. The reason I didn't want to, the reason I didn't want to cover this part was I just I didn't find this a uh, uh, resonating argument that he made. Like. I think that the rest of it, I'm like, oh, yeah, I totally see it. I feel like this is well, just where, oh, I like, this, the, the, this, I feel like this person's, you know, had, like, they were on, they were on a roll of kind of getting a lot of, like, this stuff, you know, old man yells at clouds off my, off, off their chest. And this mm -hmm. was just, like, another thing, like, while I'm here pontificating, this has been <laughs> on my mind, too. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that, really that's just, that's how I took this. I mean, I think he's definitely wrong because colonialism, I think, was pretty darn terrible, but... Also, I don't know, there's people who make claims like colonialism brought technology and infrastructure and industrialization into these countries and, you know, effective government administration and that, you know, it's, it's worth incentivizing that by letting the people that did that get some profit from it. But I think it also completely ignores all the uh, treating people like basically slaves and genocides that happened because of colonization yeah, I mean, again, which is so much worse as to not make any of the rest of it worth it oh i don't hmm. i was trying to say that there's the shade of gray where again i'm sort of saying that the jew god is suboptimal but still better like hmm. when 
yeah, like, okay, problematic so opinion, but a, a lot of places when they got colonialized, oh, it absolutely sucked. But the, again, yeah, it did bring uh, interconnectedness with the world, you know? Uh, uh, it brought, like, modern education. It brought sanitation, like, cures for diseases. Uh, but, like, it, it's both. It was terrible. It was a horrible thing to do. My response is quick, is that I don't think that there is a proper Jagad failure mode with NGOs. Like, I think that, like I said, I imagine that they were probably talking to somebody on the internet and someone, someone on the internet said NGOs are just like new colonialism and that annoyed them and it got under the author's skin and they wrote that in this post. I, I can't see a mm -hmm. parallel, whatever, but you guys have both sounded different since you guys got up to fix that spill. If you guys notice a difference in sound quality, there was a, a hiccup after a spill, I don't know, 20 something minutes ago, maybe. Now we're back on the good mics. And if you listened to that and enjoyed the, the slightly lower quality sound, then thanks for sticking it out. And if you skipped to get here, well, <laughs> welcome, welcome back. All right, less wrong posts. Steven, you want to take it away then? <laughs> I'll get us started. We were on expressing your concerns. And this is follow up to mm -hmm. the uh, Ash Conformity Experiment. And it, it talks about how... Uh, being a voice of dissent can bring real benefits to a group, but it also famously has a cost. And then you have to keep it up, plus you could be wrong. And this this is just sounds like shit. Yeah, there's there's like four different downsides to the to this unfortunate piece of wiring that we have. And uh honestly, having having a voice of dissent, this this is something that uh, I think good companies encourage. Um, they, they don't shut down dissent. They say, you know, look, if anyone disagrees, bring it up, even if you're not sure why. And just a shout out, my company does that, and it, I think it works out really well. Um, you know, at the end of the day, it's still the CTO's call, but I think he makes informed decisions based on what the group says. It's a, uh, it's a sen about as sensible as he can get. I had someone on the Discord bring up that uh, the Israeli military apparently has a tenth man rule. If there's uh, ten people discussing some course of action, and the first nine all agree to it, the thir the tenth one has to disagree and come up with some reason why, uh, why. I really this like that, yeah. like because that removes the stigma of being like you're, and and there's a levity that you're like, oh, ha ha, you got to be the disagreeer, Bob. Mm -hmm. You know, that's interesting. I would, as you know, I like I like the idea of mandating that just to have a dissenting voice. Like, yeah. yeah, yeah, and then I feel like ten is a lot. <laughs> <laughs> right. I honestly was like, I feel like this should be a rule, like in group discussions. Ooh, we could try like making it a real less strong groups or something. Uh, yeah. Then again, we mostly talk about video games or something. But <laughs> <laughs> if you're like the fourth person, you have to be like, no, Infinity War sucks or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, you have to bring a hot take. So yeah, it says the most fearsome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it says the most fearsome possibility that's raised by Ask's conformity experiment is that uh, th there's the possibility that actually everybody in the group disagrees nobody thinks this is the right idea but they're swayed by everybody else saying yes i agree and uh not realizing that everyone else thinks that too and this is known as pluralistic ignorance i've come across this so many times but i'm sure you've experienced this when when you finally do you know give voice to it someone else is like oh i thought the same thing i just didn't want to say just thinking of mostly like time at the video games company since that was most of my career uh We'd be fighting about a thing for a while and maybe people are just exhausted by fighting about it maybe they've learned that no matter what they say and try to push it doesn't matter so the ceo will come and be like okay here's our new name for our game we're gonna call it bees with the z i'm just <laughs> making shit up uh and everybody's just like yeah it's fine no seriously does anybody dislike it no no it's fine and then like the day after everybody will like be at lunch like god i hate that name i know right <laughs> uh, it is said that the most important lesson to take away from the experiment is to distinguish expressing concern from disagreement raising a point that mm. others haven't voiced is not a promise to disagree with the group at the end of its discussion and i really think this is one of the best parts about talking with other rationalists is that you can do that uh because god for the most part anytime Oh, people take things as personal attacks way too easily. Yeah, yeah. Anytime you're like, okay, well, hold on a sec, I have a concern. They're like, oh, I see. So you're not, you're not with, uh, you're not for getting rid of racism now. I'm like, wait, what? No, I didn't say anything like that. I'm like, okay, yeah, yeah. Look at Mr. Racist over here, or whatever the case happens to be. You know, 
Yeah, things things get uh, silly pretty quick, and people can't express themselves, right? Um, I yeah. I think that it's valuable. You know, you can do it in the in whatever you can cut your your dissent in terms of like expressing concern or whatever. But I I've made a habit basically since like late in school when I finally got the confidence to like I don't know talk in front of a class, but asking stupid questions. You know, or what seem to you like stupid questions, but you're probably not the only person thinking it. And good teachers and managers and whatever will recognize that. You know, they'll they'll encourage. If you have a question, stop me and ask because you're probably not the only person with that question. Um, people forget that you know the the distance between what they're thinking and what the like furthest person from them on the inferential distance meter in the meeting has. Right. So just bringing it up is helpful. <laughs> it's really weird that I'm. I keep being called in by management to consult about like what people on second shift are thinking. Hmm. And it's another, like, I don't know, every so often well, I have like pretty low self-esteem and I'm just like, I feel like I've kind of been backsliding with regard to assertiveness and social skills and whatever. But like, I complained about a few things and apparently like it's a, all these things are things people have been thinking about and struggling with. And I was the only one that came forward. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and now like, yeah, like, there's, one of the people on the business side and one of the managers keeps grabbing me when they see me and they're like, how are things between these two people? And like, have you noticed any improvement? <laughs> like, you know, just give me insights into what people are thinking. Mm -hmm. I'm just like, it's weird that I've become that go-to person. I mean, at least they have someone. That's really nice that yeah, you're there. I, I mean, guess. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of weird purity cultures where any sort of disagreement is seen as attacking the group. And I, I, I hate understand them. why it's there. Cause, uh, I'm just apparently disagreeable enough that I'll do that eventually anyway. Mm -hmm. That's probably why I haven't, like, why I've gotten uh, lost my last, like, three jobs or whatever. Um, because I, I can't deal with companies that can't deal with criticism, mm -hmm. I guess. It's part of it. But, like, this company actually genuinely, from what I can tell, uh, really wants to collaborate, wants to hear people's opinions, like, cares about whether employees enjoy working there or not, and wants to make a good product. Which is like, it, it's funny to say this as though it's really shocking, but. <laughs> so the, the post, the last thing I pulled out of the post is that people aren't hardwired to distinguish expressing a concern from disagreement, even with common knowledge. And that this distinction that we're talking about here is a rationalist artifice. Mm. Uh, that if you perform the group service of being the one who gives voice to the obvious problems, don't expect the group to thank you for it. I think that's very important, I guess, to keep in consideration in the wider world i'm not sure i think in a group of rationalists it's okay to do this because i mean it is a rationalist artifice but if we're all rationalists then we all agree to this uh standard right so that that we <laughs> actually will thank yeah. people for disagreeing and bringing up issues i've had a problem in my life especially when it comes to creative things you know uh I wrote a few chapters of a book. Can you read this? And like, it's great. Or like, here, I've drawn this thing. Can, like, can you look at it? Oh, it's great. I like it. And no, like, please give critique. I'm actually trying to like get someone's opinion of it. Oh, it's better than I could do. You've probably experienced that too, Nash. Like, <laughs> That's why, yeah, generally I only go with other writers because we know what we want. <laughs> and just in culture generally, though, it's really hard to get people's honest opinions. And mm -hmm. I, and also people don't, want your honest opinions and I have a hard time dealing with that and it's so much nicer to talk to rationalists where I'm like oh man I can't wait to talk about this thing where I know people are going to tear it apart from all different angles and I'm going to learn all kinds of new things and have different perspectives I didn't have and then get to fight about it <laughs> I strongly agree although I keep hearing Rick's voice in my head about let's not break our arms jerking ourselves off or whatever <laughs> I think we can give ourselves credit right, where it's lonely? not every proposed change is an improvement but every improvement is a change right yeah Okay, Lonely Descent uh, is where Eliezer says that Lonely Descent doesn't feel like going to school dressed in black. It feels like going to school wearing a clown suit, uh, which is probably where that, I mean, that's where I always thought the, the meme came from. Uh, that's the difference between joining the rebellion and leaving the pack. Um, do people want to say things about this? I'm, I'm starting to flail here. <laughs> I just want to bring up that in middle school, I got really mad at conformist fashion and then the way that the goths were also conforming so i would go to school in like re really big swishy pants like a men's 3xl t-shirt with like three dolphins 
and as many necklaces and like shit that I could like cram on my arms as possible mm-hmm. <laughs> to be as anti-fashion as possible. <laughs> and then I was really embarrassed by it the next year. And I was like, Oh, past me did that. Mm-hmm. And then after that, I was like, man, past me was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I had a similar, but like, yeah, that was basically me going to school in a clown suit. <laughs> I never went to school wearing a loud clown suit, but I did go. I, I did wear one in my head. I was also confused by the goth kids who, like, you know, put on what looked like a, a lot of effort worth of makeup just to let everyone know how little they care. Um, and it, <clears throat> but but I get you know that it's a uniform for a reason, and that just communicate communicate that message, but. Um, I like this line that it says, what takes real courage is braving the outright incomprehension of the people around you. They don't hate you for a rebel. They just think you're like weird and turn away. This prospect generates a much deeper fear. And it does. And it's weird. Like I'd rather be on someone's radar as like, you know, oh, there's that, you know, the one who takes a knee during the national anthem rather than like the, the one who, I don't know, whatever stands on his head, uh, during the national anthem, right? Mm-hmm. Like it, mm-hmm. it's yeah, yeah. Being being a rebel has uh, has this kind of re- refuge that you can go to, and that like you're doing something that you believe in, and you're doing that as uh, as a um, as a weird stance too. But it's not comprehensible to the people around you, right? They just think you're weird. Yeah, there's like, you know, like you could be a punk or mm-hmm. a goth or whatever. And you do still have a subculture and you do still have iconography that people like look at and understand. Whereas the loneliness of this is like, it's just me versus the world. Yeah. Uh, This reminds me of something from uh, Tim Ferriss's recommendations about how to get over like basic fears and anxieties. One thing that he encourages people to do are these things called fear setting exercises, which involve like going into a supermarket and then just like laying face down on the floor. Wow. And timing it and like if anyone asks what like you have to i forget what you have to say like something like oh i'm just laying on the floor you're not allowed to explain mm. and you just get up and walk away and like it's a bunch of exercises that basically like are do a weird thing in public and the lesson each time is like you're terrified to do it and then you do it it's terrifying and then nothing happens afterwards and you're like oh <laughs> <laughs> this wasn't such a big deal after all that's a fun exercise i think that'd be uh, valuable I, yeah the point is made here that as the case of cryonics testifies, the fear of thinking really different is stronger than the fear of death. <laughs> and pointing out that hunter gatherers had to be ready to face death on a routine basis. So maybe that makes some sense. And real quick, before we forget about it, uh, there's more than one cryonicist in the world. So even that isn't the hugest fear now. Only Robert Edinger had to say it first. So uh, I think we should give mad props to Robert Edinger right here. And, you know, maybe look up what day it was that he got preserved <laughs> and maybe thinking, make that. Yeah. Should we have a, a shout out day? day as well? Mm-hmm. Where you pour like yourself Pavlov a cold one. Have love. But I'm. I love it. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, not everything that takes courage is a good idea. <laughs> Other people do have reasons for thinking what they do. And ignoring that is ignoring that completely is as bad as being afraid to contradict them, which, uh, yeah, actually ties back into the main topic, too. All right, Stephen. Anything before we wrap up? No, I was I I was tempted to go on like a uh, tangent on the boys, but that takes us too far afield. So I think I'm good. All right, I could keep talking, but it seems like you guys are tired, and I'm I want to respect your like self care regimens. I appreciate. I, I it. think one of the <laughs> I think one of the interesting things to keep in mind uh, during these two posts that we just read from a historical perspective is that. At this time, uh, Eliezer was trying to do something which was extremely weird and uh, very off-putting to a a large section of uh, the the scientific community and academia in general in saying that uh, artificial intelligence was a thing that could happen very soon and that was a extreme existential threat to the human species. And I, I mean, in a way, he's sort of saying like, look, this takes a lot of courage, guys. And I think that's legit because nowadays, like we have entire organizations that talk about this and are looking into how to fix it. But at the time, he was one of the very first people. He was- <laughs> It was him and like some sci-fi authors. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, he was certainly one of the first people to do it loudly, publicly, uh, seriously. Non-anonymously. And non-anonymously and, and really try to push it in the real world, not just like in a science fictional sort of setting. 
And that took like some serious balls. And that's why he's pointing out things like, dudes, this is like wearing a fucking clown suit. This is scary as shit, but sometimes you have to do that. And I want everyone to remember that sometimes you do have to have courage to say these kinds of things and not get hung up by, oh, it looks so, so weird. Other people are going to shun me. And he actually says in the posts that for him, this wasn't that hard due to psychological quirks of his. <laughs> he's the kind of pe person who would like to say, yeah, clown suit, sure, whatever, you know, no big deal. But uh, for most people, it's difficult. It's and when you're trying to, me. yeah, and when you're trying to rally other people to the cause of, hey, I can't do this thing alone. Obviously, we, we need to work on this on a societal level. Uh, it's good to make people feel like this takes some courage and is admirable to say that this might actually be a real problem. Mm, and it also benefits to have organizations that will bake that in, you know, like, mm -hmm. I like the idea of like the 10 people versus like the one person or even just companies that like, Stephen, you said your company's good at this. Mine is of making people feel safe enough and like their opinions are valuable enough to actually come forward and say, well, I don't think this is a good idea for these reasons. Yeah. It, it's you know, awesome. not going to like, you know, and get fired or be personally attacked. <laughs> totally. And I, I, you know, I do like the, the analogy of the clown suit because being laughed at is scary. Right. Um, and I think that that's oh, why yeah. I chose clown suit no, rather than like naked, fear. you know, because if Ellie Isser would have walked to school naked, everybody would be like, damn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I mean that it that it fit for the, like, people will laugh at you, and that's the scary part, right? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, I get the joke you're making, too. Well. For next time, we have To Lead, You Must Stand Up, and Cultish Counter Cultishness. Yeah, and we have our Patreon. So, for this two weeks of Basing Conspiracy Time, we're thinking Joshua Reed... Yay, Joshua Reed. Thank you very much. You <laughs> you had the courage to stand up and support the thing you like. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> what else? Uh, uh, we are trying to hack together a podcast. I don't know. Yeah. I, I like the standing up and courage thing. Yeah. <laughs> I think Jason knows. <laughs> yeah, you are big on the Jew God ideology. I, yeah. I like Jew God ideology, though, especially, again, when you don't have something. I mean, okay. Nope. Nope. We're done. Okay, we, got, we got to call it. <laughs> fine. <laughs> Thank All you, right. Joshua. Uh, Stephen, good night. Uh, we'll, we'll, <laughs> Thanks, Josh. <laughs> thank you very much, Josh. That's awesome. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us. And we'll see you again in two High weeks. High five. Thanks. Bye, guys.